Hello everyone, welcome to the Pinkin.com Norwich City podcast. My name is Michael Bailey, I'm joined by sports desk Pete and Paddy David. Um, and this was supposed to be the point at which we talked about all that great building on the win at Spurs, how things were, were going to be different this time. Paddy, they were going to be different this time, weren't they? Different. They conceded four this time. Yeah. Right? <laughs> oh no. As opposed to previous defeats. Uh, of recent nature yeah 4-1 at Aston Villa it all looked so promising um, and then yeah rather well, it was a sort of a first half capitulation and a second half non-event and we're left in the same place as we were Pat what were you thinking on this Monday afternoon how do you I mean you have that is technically what happened but how you actually process that in terms of how in control Norwich were how agitated that home crowd were ready to really mutiny even to the point where any pass that was backwards instead of forwards was triggering waves of disapproval we would uh, we could hear it and if it was coming through on the TV but just to go from that to wandering down the half time tunnel 4-1 down it just beggars belief and you can pick, pick whatever side of the fence you want whether it was a brilliant goal from Benteke or whether it was poor defending and the second of his surely was poor defending and then obviously an own goal got done on a counter attack it was just a tale of woe very depressing given performances had certainly improved and results were starting to turn you felt after Tottenham and they're back right where they were in the pit of despair and needing something from Stoke I mean we'll come on to the first goal eventually but just in terms of the turnaround I was taking the lead after three minutes but the first goal was just a world class goal it was something pretty special from Christian Benteke yeah. I suppose the issue really is the fact that from that moment Norwich seemed to defensively lose their heads they could see the second goal from just a corner as good a header as it was uh, two minutes later and then they just fall apart there's just nothing there is there there's no fight there's this white flag again isn't it they've done it so many times away from home and the first 20 minutes you just thought can't see better getting in this at all and okay, I guess it's a bit of a cliche. It takes a wonder goal to get them back in it, but from that point onwards, they just fell to pieces, and I don't really know how you explain it. Is there an issue that Norwich's plan is involves not conceding a goal? <laughs> and, and as soon as plan, that happens, it's like yeah, I think Norwich's plan. There is only one plan. That's the problem. Nothing changes when Villa were just sort of sweeping forth, and we weren't doing anything to change it, and. I think as soon as the second went in, it's like Norwich are never going to come back. I don't think they have away from home for a long time. No, it's a frightening. I remember working out a few months and the amount of times Norwich have scored goals to come back from behind to win a point, or never mind three. Yeah, you can probably count them on one hand. So it's uh, it's not great. I remember thinking of telling you this, Pad, that I wanted to uh, when it was three one. Cry. Well, that <laughs> that as well. A three one. I was about to uh, tweet or post on, on the live coverage. Uh, the one thing Norris must make sure they don't do now is concede another one. And they'd already conceded another one before I got to actually tie that out. Um, it, is that the, the, the sort of pattern from this paddy that they just haven't, they can't seem to cope with conceding a goal? I don't, yeah, that, that is it. And, and it ha- it's happened before with Villa recently under Lambert's watch because. I was thinking about it this morning that it was the Capital One down here where Norwich were in control of that game and they just went bang, bang, bang. Ben Teke again, Vyman and Bon Lahore, no, notable sidekicks. And it's just like they can't handle the power and the ferocity when, when these teams with players of that ilk who, who can go through the gears have pace, directness, and can finish. There just doesn't seem to be any any concept of how you stem the tide I mean Hume was talking about even when it's 2-1 we need to, to be be more resistant and dig in but it's all very well saying that but the evidence is that he has a group of players who are incapable of doing that and he's incapable of equipping them with some sort of as Pete alluded to there uh, some sort of template that can resist you know it's just happening too often to be written off as well that was brilliance from A and other because it was brilliant but you get that that's why they're in the Premier League they need to be stronger they need to be mentally tougher and physically as well you know the way Basson got 
ragdolled out of the way by Ben Teke. I mean, Ben Which Teke time? Is, <laughs> is a perfect physical specimen, but Bassong is not exactly uh, five foot two and eight stone wet through, is he? He's a big unit as well, and he, you know, you don't want a single one lad out because it was a collective capitulation in those 16 minutes of carnage, but. It's so concerning, really, that it could what may over the next ten games, whether they stay up or not. You know, it's so they're so far away from a team who you feel could stabilise and go on as Southampton have, as I don't know Everton, I suppose, them sort of clubs. But you just do not see under the current regime where the evolution is coming from. But obviously, that's for the future. All it's up the here and now is keeping their heads above water. Yeah. Just, which they're just about I think the, the legs are going pretty quickly at the, at the moment uh, before we get into the other bits let's have some Norwich City player reaction shall we oh that's right there isn't any <laughs> yeah because there was a massive fire alarm afterwards we don't know who set it off or why uh, the media set we, we weren't special enough to actually be evacuated from the ground we were evacuated we were evacuated <laughs> into the tunnel where we continued to do our work <laughs> um, and that um, brought uh, both managers together before they'd really had a chance to speak to each other um, the Villa chief executive was there on the phone it was all incredibly awkward but rather fascinating to watch uh, the, but the be all and end all was that the Norwich players were evacuated or at least evacuated themselves straight onto the bus and we never saw them so we never got a word from them I'm reliably informed we would have done had it not been for the fire alarm so there you go uh, Norwich took the lead and they were very good in the opening 20 minutes let's say that yeah. <laughs> lovely goal from the returning, returned Wes Houlihan great move from Gary Hooper who might have been offside I still think no he says no um, are, where are we on the debate because we should talk about it of uh, Wes Houlihan when he scored I think there's only one man who should lead that debate it's, it's very split isn't it I still think that are you <laughs> Well, the way he was treated, it, was, it wasn't out of the blue, was it? There was a double fist pump, but that was about it, really. So he, he did fist pump? Because I must admit, I, I saw it in the ground and thought, well, this is a bit weird, he isn't doing a lot. And then I haven't seen it since. I do want to... I, I didn't get to watch match of the day two last night, so I did want to see it again. I haven't had the chance. I don't, but you're saying there was, there was a fist yeah. pump and he was like, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's been comments that it was early in the game, so I don't care if it's the first minute or the last minute, you celebrate a goal. I wonder... I mean, well, and Snodgrass did at Cardiff, even, and that was fairly on. Even it? him yeah. being at the yeah. opposite end from the away edge should make much difference. Well, again, the same at Cardiff. Wes isn't a huge celebrator, is he? But well, he brings out the forward roles. No, it was Gary Hooper. Like, I remember a couple of Carrots where he just, he just yeah. stood there. And yeah. it's Justin Fashion who goal of the season. He sticks his finger in the air. So, but I think that there is, the, there is a bit more to it than there is a reason why he didn't celebrate and it's a fact that he's been left out half the season and wants to leave and well this is it this is ultimately the, the issue with what happened in January isn't it Paddy you, everyone's kind of forgiven it yeah, but no yeah. one forgot it no, but that, that is all true but, but sure, surely the proof is in the pudding and it was the fact that he was for, for the first 25 minutes the best player on the park now if that was a, a guy who was surly and wasn't going to put a shift in you wouldn't have got any end product of that nature. There was another one, wasn't there, where linked to Hooper again, Guzan saved with his legs and then the follow up header. So he could have easily walked off the pitch in the first half there with two goals. Now, he might not well have, you know, started singing and dancing, but if he's scored you two goals and he's been the key influence, then that really is the only barometer I think you need to measure the guy's influence. And for me, it's a bit of a non-issue. Really. Concentrate more on the fact that he scored rather than yeah. well, celebrating it. Yeah. And I mean, he did tire significantly in the second half, but again, you can probably expect that. The first 20 minutes, he was bombing around yeah. everywhere. And the way him and Gary Hooper were linking together, which is not for the first time either, is it, Paddy? I mean, they, no. out of every combination that's been tried, as an actual two up front, Palace, they're yeah. the two that work, aren't yeah. they? I must admit, I've, I would have thought Harrison might have started instead of Hulahan just for formation, but... Yeah. Like you say, 20 minutes he disappeared, but then he wasn't the only one. No. Well, I'd argue that Wes disappeared a lot later than some other people disappeared. <laughs> I think they, they'd gone a bit earlier than that. Um, mentioned that Wes's second chance. Uh, I mean, the second half was an entire non event, really. Uh, Johan Almanda came on and was playing out on the right wing. Did, was he playing? Well, 
Well, he was, he was on the pitch. He was definitely there, and he kept sort of walking around in that area. Was he, was he the source of uh, some anger amongst the well, fans? Well, I, I mean, we got we even got to the point where the Norwich fans were asking Paul Lambert for a wave. Really? Yeah. Oh dear. So, I'd rather um, go to away games anymore. It was uh, it was quite fractious. I would mean, be fair to say. Hooper's chance. I thought he could have maybe scored taken on a bit. <laughs> well, yeah. Bit weak, wasn't it? That yeah. side foot finish, beat a keeper of goose on his class, and he to be better than that. And that's the sort of thing he he actually hit one of those perfectly in the warm up, pinged so it in off the post. But, um, <laughs> so, you know, they're good in training, they can do it in training. He needs a goal, doesn't he, badly? Because you think back to West Ham as well, he could have had two or three that yeah. night. And if he could just get one, as he showed, he went on a little burst, didn't he, before? So it's the old confidence thing again, just anything at all to drop to him that he can slot, that, that might just kick him on again. Again, though, it's that they're so brittle. That it was the same with Hull. You hoped that that would be a win that would sort of instill something in them. And I suppose with, comp- with performances it had, but just cannot get those results, can they? Um, so the other big talking point, uh, unless anyone can remind me, although there, there were maybe a couple. One, Alex Tetty, quite a nasty challenge on Nathan Baker. Was he a little lucky to stay on the pitch, do you think, Pad? Or he was booked for it, I think. Yeah, I think he was, yeah. It was a bit of a wild one, wasn't it? I- Intense, a separate issue in terms of whether he, I don't think he probably meant to do that, but no. but I think it, I can't remember the timeline. But uh, was it two one down, three one down? So he was yeah. in that maelstrom. Yeah. He saw Snodgrass as well. Went through Bertram. Frustration had balled over there, and uh, I think one or two just sort of lost their heads a little bit during that period. So yes, in terms of you've seen red cards for a lot less, haven't you? So, and at least Norwich didn't get anyone sent off, which I still maintain was something of a positive to take from the event. Uh, Grant Hull came on. He didn't score, Pete. Everyone was convinced. I know. He didn't really do Bless a him. great he, deal. He, um, well, he didn't, didn't need to. Didn't really look at the races, I'll be honest, and his, the ball was bobbling off his shin and all sorts. Um, but he got a great... Pardon? Standard, isn't it? Standard. Um, he got a great reception from the Norwich fans though, all the way through his warm up each time the name was mentioned right to so, yeah. yeah and Lambert as well I don't know what his reception was like uh, well it was me apart from one chant for a wave in the second half which I think many people could take as maybe a a, a gesture towards who's <laughs> the people maybe more on the Norwich City yeah. side of the fence at the moment sadly um, so we got we got one chance and yeah, Grant Holt took the time to applaud the Norwich fans after he'd spoken to all his teammates. Fairly it's all fair enough. Fairly complimentary on Twitter as well, wasn't he? He was, Post yeah. Match. I imagine he went place again, so... OK, well, who knows? Well. <laughs> never say never, Pete, never say never. Um, I think I've touched on everything. Is there anything I haven't... Anyone think of anything I haven't mentioned? Apart from the Villa goals, but... Well, I think Paul Lambert was very happy with their third... But seen I would before, them, seen so. before, and bon the whole counter attack down here last season. Completely outstripped Redmond at one point, didn't he? Oh, you man, noticed that. That, I mean, that man can shift. No two ways about it. But it's not as if you didn't know the threat. I can't. I can't remember a game where he hasn't been quite influential in the recent season. So you, they know what they knew what the threat was, and that's the frustrating thing and had started it wasn't like from, they were on the back foot from the first minute of that game they were in control of that game mm. one long diagonal ball Benteke chest goal and that's it back did you, down the hatches did you pick up on anything that because we obviously know how much Paul Lambert loves to change and tinker and things did you did you pick up pick up on anything he did to change it or was it predominantly the goal and then that just sparked well, I think it was purely just one class finish and then and then two minutes later, Benteke corner. I mean, that's not any major tactical light bulb moment, is it? It's just playing to the guy's strengths and once it went two one, the crowd get up and instead of getting on their backs, they're driving them forward and and now actually just seeped out of them, didn't it? Well, that self belief. Because Villa didn't really do anything in the second half either, did they? No, <laughs> I suppose there was the a work had been done. Chance for a bomb the hall, wasn't there? And about five minutes after the remarks rose between Bassong and Yobo which was the theme of the day yeah. and uh, should have buried it but headed it straight at Ruddy but they, they were quite content weren't they just to go through the motions as long as Norwich did which we're never going to do really we will threaten <laughs> any potential comeback they were quite happy with four on it um, we just talked about this on Master TV actually on 3 Up Front Extra I'm getting that plug in yeah you just heard that um, uh, Villa do you think they're probably safe now I mean it's been we've been talking about how tight the bottom half of the table is Pete but there's actually a few gaps now, aren't there? And 
That's, I think, 31 points mm. of Villa on now. Well, it's strange, isn't it, that before the game, everyone was talking about Villa and Swansea being safe and their long odds when they were just on the same points as Norwich. I know the last four games have factored into that, but you would expect Villa to still be in the Premier League next season. I suppose the interesting thing is that Cardiff and Fulham have that They're gap. Gone. Well, well, I remember saying that about um, Sunderland and Palace at the start of the season, right. and then all of a sudden they weren't gone. We'll win at Fulham this season, told you. Well, I thought they were going to win at Villa, and that didn't happen. So, um, me and Paddy both predicted wins at the weekend, so that's the last time I'll maybe give them that faith. <laughs> Until this weekend, of course, when Stoke come to town. It says three home games, isn't it? Stoke, Sunderland, West Brom. But you've got to look to pick up maximum points. Well, as I was saying to Paddy, um, because it's a long car journey, um, Norwich are currently level on the points they had from comparable fixtures last year. Yeah, comparable fixtures. All they need to do, that means, to finish on 44 points is win at Swansea. 44, right, you win. Win at Swansea, beat Stoke and Sunderland and West Brom at home, and Arsenal at home as well. And get a draw somewhere. Man, you. Yeah. It's Fulham in that. Yeah, uh, well, they lost it for them yeah, last year, so, so, so that's the issue. You win. You'd take a draw. Can't Wait, were you saying they'll, suggest they'll finish on 47 points? Is that what you're saying, Pete? Yeah. No. No, he's not. He's not saying that. All right, well, um, Stoke, we won't do a preview podcast because there's no point in promising something we won't deliver. <laughs> um, we're looking forward to that, Stoke? No. Um, I imagine Harrison will start. Yeah. Instead of? Who Okay. I don't know how long Ricky's out for. Is it just a whack? Sounded like a minor one, didn't it, Pad? Yeah, they seem to indicate that um, he was pretty close um, for Villa. So if he was pretty close for Villa and he trains this week, he should be in contention. Be interested to see what he does at the back as well. If uh, yeah, Captain gets Ryan dropped. Bennett's back, isn't he now? Well, he did. I mean, he didn't. He, he grasped the nettle, didn't he? Post Man City when he pulled Basson out of firing line. So I'll be uh, frankly amazed if Basson and Yobo start against Stoke. I'll be very sp- and also Yobo Factor and he's got this transatlantic trip to uh, America play for Nigerians Mexico so Ryan Bennett was in decent nick wasn't he before the injury so Olsen we know is now carrying a shoulder injury yeah pulled out of Sweden's midweek trip to Turkey looks like it's going to be surgery in the summer so clearly that that would indicate he's, he's having to manage an injury mm. but I mean, there was actually thinking about it. There was, he did require treatment. He did, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, he did, yeah. So maybe that was connected to that. But he did finish the game. So you know, a week's R and R, he should be okay. But Snodgrass too. He's, it's a I worry. think he's pulled out, but yeah, yeah, the that wrist damaged his wrist. We don't need that to play football. It should be fine. Yeah. <laughs> and Leroy obviously will be out for time to be the world. Yeah, we shall see. So, uh, win, win is all that we'll do for Stoke? Well, it's got to be. Pete says got to be. Paddy, sound indifferent. Well, or are you just tired? No, 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 a bit of both, yeah. <laughs> no, I think they, they do need to win, but whether they will do, I just have a feeling Stoke might do what Stoke do and maybe grind out a draw. I frankly would be surprised if they could win all those three. I know they have, they should be looking to do it, and they will, clearly, but... It's a tall order, isn't it, to beat all three of those at home. Not tall in the sense that their teams they shouldn't should be able to comfortably see off, but to go to the well, go to the well, go to the well all the time, I just think one of those three might have to be a draw. But then if they won the other two, Pete's already got us down for a winner for them, so job, yeah, jobs are good. Days. We're gonna have to that I think they are gonna have to pull out a performance away from home at some point. Because they don't think they can do it. Well, the place they've won South twice the last two yeah. years. That was the draw. Well done, Paddy. Yeah, that was the draw last season. I think that's the last time we scored a goal um, prize, wasn't it? Yeah, yes, yeah. it was. Yeah, good to get an excellent work there. I remember that one. Um, just a quick add, last one. Uh, the managerial situation, obviously Chris Hewton is under pressure again because that's what tends to happen each time Irish play, certainly each time they lose. Uh, is it too late to change the manager now? I've, I've had this conversation with a few people. Is it just an irrelevant now? Is it too, it's too late? Who do you replace him with? So do you think it's too late? Like, this is it now, just get on with it? If it happens, then it's the fault think, of yeah. not making a decision sooner? I think it's too late. Yeah, yeah, I think so. With 10 left, I mean, even if you recruited from Britain, they're still going to need that period of climatisation. 
he's and, and obviously if they went abroad then you inject that sort of uncertain element that's playing out at West Brom and Fulham as well now so you just go back to what the chief exec said recently you know if they're not 100 percent convinced at that point when they had a lot a lot more period of time to make the change then I don't think they're going to do it now no I think the one thing that the result on Sunday does do is mean there are going to be some serious discussions in the summer whatever happens but I think for this season the bed has been made lie in it I'm wrapping this up now uh, Stoke on Saturday live coverage pinkin.com slash live keep an eye out for that are we doing a Q&A midweek? yeah why not? have we decided? What, what day did we say? Did we say Tuesday? Let's do Tuesday. It's Tuesday. Fine. So, all being well, depending on when you listen to this, Tuesday, one o'clock, uh, pinkin.com forward slash debate. Join in with that. And of course, three up front on mustardtv.co.uk. Uh, that will be on Thursday evening. I can't remember who's on it, but there'll be some people. I'm on it, Michael. Are you on it? <laughs>